Welcome to our latest adventure. Today we explore Return to Ivalice, the 24-man raid series from Stormblood. Well, look who it is. About time you showed up. Hey, I had to wait in line behind 4,000 lame adventurers to board a ship to get here. Don't they know we liberated Alamigo and Doma? Luckily, I have the patience of a saint. You're not the only one. I think a reporter over there has been stalking me all evening. Maybe she wants our autograph. Well, we're about to find out. She's coming over here right now with a determined look in her eyes. Once upon a time, in Kugane Marketplace, Lena, a correspondent for the Raven, greets us and introduces us to her friend, Alma. Without much warning of what exactly is going on, Alma begs us to find her father and says, Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're his only hope. She suddenly bursts into tears and Lena suggests that we leave and discuss the issue further on the Prima Vista, their giant theater airship. Aboard the Prima Vista, we find the crew of the Majestic Imperial Theater Company. These practitioners perform the finest dramatic arts to be found anywhere. Little known fact, the late Emperor of Garlemald was a patron of the arts himself. Emperor Salas actually ordered the construction of the ship, and the Garlean troop was set out to perform in every corner of the Empire. All of that changed, though, when Varys took the throne, censoring all works that did not meet the Central Imperial Board standards. This troop, however, defies such creative restraints and continues its works in Kugane unhindered by political bounds. Alma's father created the play The Zodiac Brave Story, a retelling of a Garlean fairy tale. Or at least it was meant to be. The board had initially approved the play, but quickly came to reject it after learning of its hidden messages. Nobles withdrew their funds from the majestic troop, and worse, Alma's father had gone missing. As if on cue, Sid shows up aboard the Prima Vista and explains that he gave Alma our name when he heard that she was looking for someone to help find her father. Sid and Genomus used to be close friends in Garlemald before their paths diverged as the Empire pushed them out of their homes. We go to the bow of the ship to see a giant monitor overlooking Kugane. Alma and Lena tell us of Delita, a boy of common blood who becomes the hero of the mythical kingdom of Ivelisse. This is the Zodiac Brave story, however, Genomus was working on a new play, the true Zodiac Brave story. This new tale would tell of an unnamed second hero, one that assisted Delita in the background, helping the pauper rise to regent. Sid suggests that though Ivelisse is often referred to as a fairy tale, the place could actually exist. If Genomus were hiding somewhere, it may be there. The ruins of Ivelisse were believed to lie beyond Naxia, buried beneath the sands of the Dalmascan Desert. The lands of Dalmasco were crushed under the wake of the Garlean Empire years ago. However, artifacts such as the Orosite crystal that Alma carries with her have been found in the sands, giving proof that civilizations did once live there. As we talk, Ramza, Alma's punk brother, joins us. Ramza's been snooping around Robin Ostre, the capital city of modern-day Dalmasco. He's pissed that Alma brought outside help into their affairs, but Sid assures him that we should band together if we're to find their father. Reluctantly, Ramza agrees to take us to Delmasca so that we may help in their search for their father. While we head out, Sid states that he must leave to deal with the search for Omega. The Prima Vista departs for Robin Ostre, and we join Lena and Ramza outside to discuss our entry into the city. Ramza states that his father performed excavations around the city and concluded that Robin Ostre is not the first settlement to stand here. He believes that Robin Ostre sits atop the royal city of Lesalia, capital of Ivalice. Lena and Ramza then have a spat while we pretend not to hear. As we fight our way through the shambles of Robin Ostre, we uncover a waterway leading deep beneath the city. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming, just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. It's here that we discover the lost city of Lesalia from the tales of Ivalice. It was just as Junimus predicted. Ivalice sleeps beneath Robin Ostre. I am Revelation! You will be judged. After we clear the area, we find Genimus in the ruins, confused and hurt. Before much can be said, bounty hunters fall from the sky and take Rems's father hostage. They want the orosite we just picked up in exchange for Genimus. We hand over the shard and the hunters cry out that they have long last found the Duma. With the display of force, the bounty hunter shoots one of their own, takes Genimus' journal, and releases him as they make their retreat. Their shot friend suddenly gets up and sprints after the airship too. These are some odd creatures. With Genimus resting aboard on the Prima Vista and Alma crying again, we return to Kugane. Sid meets up with us so we can tell him of our encounter. 
Perhaps the most interesting observation was that the Oris site in Ivalice did not hold an icon's aether, like with Ysail and Shiva, but rather the Oris site absorbs the soul of the creator and transforms it before returning their soul. Sid asks Genimus if he found what he was looking for. Genimus goes on to explain that the Zodiac Brave story tells not of just Delita, but of other heroes. Two others, in fact, a brother and a sister named Ramza and Alma. Genimus ended up naming his own children after these heroes, whose credit was lost in retellings of the tale. The Zodiac Brave story was never just an obsession, but his purpose, his family's purpose. Genimus sent Lexington is but a stage name. His true name is Arislam Durai. Oran Durai, his ancestor, was a friend of Ramza and Delita from the stories. Oran documented Ramza's assistance of Delita following the War of the Lions. The church learned of his intent, however, and branded him a heretic to be burned at the stake. The Durai papers were never published, and the only copies were sealed away in the church vaults, forever hiding the truth about Ivelisse. Flash forward to today, and the only thing that we have to go off of is a copy of the original manuscript, kept within the now Lexentale family. The only problem is that they're written in High Ivelisian, so we can't really read them any longer. The journal that the bounty hunters stole contained the few translations they were able to complete over generations. Alma whispers to us that she believes her father to be obsessed with the writings and asks that we keep him safe. In order to learn more, we call upon an Archon from Charlian, Mikoto. She is a Doman native and greets us as the Warrior of Light and has the audacity to say that she thought we'd be taller. She brings over the Orosite and begins to explain how the crystal works, but is somehow more difficult to understand than Ariange. Sid asks that she stop being such a nerd and explain it normally. She attempts to explain again and receives further blank stares, and Sid asks her to try again. Finally, she's able to convey that this crystal is the Otius, one of many shards Delita used to rise to power. Put plainly, the crystal can absorb Aether in the form of a wish or intent, multiply it, and manifest it. This lines up with what we saw at Robin Ostre. According to the Durai papers, Argoth never became King of Ivelisse. He died in the War of the Lions. Yet, the Argoth we encountered after the Orosite was used had claimed to be king, a manifestation of his desire to rule. While the Orosite is a potentially dangerous tool, it is only as dangerous as the intent of the wielder. This behavior seems more like a created science than that of nature. It now begs the question, if Argoth's intent was imprinted into the Orosite, Duma, that the bounty hunters took, then whose intent lies within our oversight, Odious? Makoto has found no traces of an imprint made, yet Alma claims to hear voices within. Suddenly, a Moogle flies in to break up the awkwardness of Ramza being a brat to Alma. It's Montblanc, a denizen of Dalmaska and a thrill seeker. He wishes to join the majestic troop. His companion, Hurdy, comes in to talk some sense into him, but it's no use. Montblanc has convinced himself that in order to earn the role of Delita in the upcoming plays, he must defeat a great beast. Of course, we have to go after the poor Moogle so he doesn't get hurt. After saving Montblanc from some red chocobos, we learn a valuable lesson. You don't always need to fight alone to be the hero of the story. In fact, that seems to be a common theme in our own adventures. As we return to the Prima Vista, we find what appears to be another hostage situation. But this time, the bounty hunters have Alma. They claim to have no quarrel with us. They seek aid in finding their leader, Bagaman. They must really want him back because they surrender their weapons and give us back the journal. As we settle down a few notches, we can see about shedding some light on the situation. It's likely that their leader was absorbed into the RSI he stole. To learn of his greatest desire, our guests tell us a story. They were once stationed in the royal stronghold at Nalbina as part of the Dalmascan army. Bagaman was the captain of their squadron. As the Garlean Empire closed in, Prince Razlar commanded their team to escort Princess Ashalia away from the fortress. However, things did not go as planned and she died in Bagaman's arms. So Bagaman's greatest desire would likely be to save the princess in some way. As the tale ends, Genomus finds a new entry in his journal, one left by Bagaman. He wrote, Ritterana. It's just the name of an old lighthouse in the Vanald Sea, south of Robin Ostre. Legend would have it though that there lies the entrance to the Hell of Water. We talk with Genomus, but the mystery of Ritterana still eludes him and may take longer than expected. In the meantime, he says that he's requested our presence because their resident dramaturge mentioned that there was something he wished to ask us. This uh, wandering dramaturge has us go wine tasting for his anniversary present? What a waste of time! We meet up again with Genomus, who has the audacity to inquire if we had a productive time these past few days. 
The group assembles, and Genomis explains that with the fall of Rabinastri, the old lighthouse of Ritarana has been since abandoned. We take a boarding party out to scout the area and look for Pagamen. Atop a wrecked building, we spy the once captain. We call out to him, but his vision is twisted. Pagamen sees us as Imperials. The Duma must be twisting his mind. He tries to shoot Lina, but we step between them and strike him down first. Pagamen speaks the words of the Covenant and is spared his death, giving his Aether to the Orsite. His body transforms to a monstrosity, and he teleports away. We retreat back to the Prima Vista. Bagaman's soul is lost. When we return to the ship, Ramza explains what we found, and is, as usual, a brat to Alma. Makoto explains that the lighthouse sits atop a waterfall and houses the clockwork city of Gog, according to the Zodiac Brave story. This metropolis is where airships, automata, and other technological marvels of the age were first conceived. After some discussion on the origins of Alma's crystal necklace, we set out to explore the lost city. After defeating Pagamen, we pick up the orosite he was carrying, along with what looks like Alma's necklace. As Ramza goes to pick it up, he is knocked to the floor unconscious. We bring him back to the Prima Vista. Taking a closer look at the necklace, it matches the one Alma wears, but the stones are different. Or rather, the stones are different shapes, cut from the same orosite. Bagaman received his from the prince and was to deliver it to the princess once she was safe, but that never came to be. Ramza awakes, but he's different. More polite? Makoto surmises that the necklace may be similar to the orosite and have the will of the former owner or creator of the crystal. In this case, to return to Ivelisse. Roll credits. After some time away from the ship, we come back to find that Alma is feeling unwell. Nothing physical, but the doctors say that it could be stress from being in a new land for so long. Looking more into our next destination, Genomus and Ramza suspect that the Orban Monastery could hold the secrets to learning more about Ramza Bale. During the War of the Lions, he lost many companions there to the Lakavi demons. It also is the homeland of Princess Ovelia. It was after Delita emerged victorious from this campaign that he married Ovelia to legitimize his claim to the throne of Ivelisse. Now the supposed creature that created the Orosite slumbers beneath the monastery, Ultima, the High Seraph. Interesting, we know an Ultima of our own. Perhaps our Ultima machine was based on this one. Scholars and Charlene have already concluded that the spell we saw our Ultima theoretically manifest should not be possible. As for finding the Orban Monastery, we're to look for a waterfall several leagues southeast of Rabinastri. However, the river is long dried up, but geographically, it should have been the border between Golmor and Naxian, thanks to our native Mughals. Our main problem with going there isn't the vipers or monsters, but the Viera. These bunny folk don't take kindly to trespassers. Well, short on leads, Sid drops off a piece of equipment to Mikoto for a secret device. She believes that Alma is unknowingly connected to the Otias Orosite. Because of this, she theorizes that Alma is growing ill from the Orosite, drawing forth her desires. However, unlike Bagaman, her desire is not nearly as strong. The device Makoto is creating will hope to lessen the effects. We then get word that Bawagi wants to meet with us, and us alone. Well, Mont Blanc too, since he won't leave. He takes us aboard his private vessel back to Marabinastri. Apparently the crew has joined Lent's Tier, a resistance group that plans to liberate Dalmasca from Garlean control. We're here to listen to a proposal from the resistance leader. And who could it be but a Viera? Her name is Fran, general of Lent's Tier and proud daughter of Dalmasca. We tell her we seek passage to the monastery deep within Gelmore jungle, but she does not take kindly to the Garleans we would travel with. After a quick parlay, we learn that these bunnies have unrealistic expectations of what they think we can pull off as the Warrior of Light. Who do we look like? Alpha now? Pran states that in exchange for men willing to fight for Dalmasca and a bunch of money from the East Aldenar Trading Company, she will escort our group into the monastery. Those aboard the Prima Vista feel as though we have no choice but to accept Fran's offer. At the Ruby Bazaar, we talk with our financial advisor, Hancock, along with Yugiri and Tataru. Hancock informs our escort, Bowagi, that the East Eldenar Trading Company cannot afford to lend money to a war effort as they want to remain neutral. Similarly, Tataru and Yugiri mention that the Grand Alliance and Doma cannot lend aid. However, Yugiri does mention that Doma is willing to fight long term with refugees of Dalmasca. It is only unwise to form such a rushed assault when Dalmasca itself is not ready to fight on its own. 
This is exactly what Bawagi and Fran were expecting from us, saying that this decision will help their leader to see the reality of the situation. Once again, aboard the Prima Vista, we discuss alternate plans. Before we get far, Fran and Bawagi enter the ship. They say that despite not meeting a single of their demands, their leader has asked them to compensate us for our attempt to negotiate by helping us seek out the monastery in Gulmore Jungle. Fran explains how the entrance to the ruins is hidden behind the waterfall. Duh. As we plan our course of action, Alma returns from her rest. She claims the High Seraph speaks to her through the Otius. The High Seraph wants Alma to come and free Ultima from her prison so that her family name may be cleansed. Her father, Nor Ramza, will have her step in harm's way, though. But they're too late. Alma's eyes glow as she speaks not of her own intent. She wonders why her father loves Ramza more than her, and before we can understand what is happening, she is sucked into a rift and disappears, crying out Ramza's name. The only thing clear is that Alma's last wish was to go to the monastery. If we are to save her, we should take Makoto's device that interferes with the Orosite and head there to attempt to break this curse. Upon arriving at the Gulmore jungle, we find Alma on the path, clearly under the Orosite's influence. As she disappears again into the rift, Ramza reaches out to grab her. We quickly toss Ramza the Dispeller device and he uses it to shatter the Orosite, releasing Alma from the rift. An ominous voice cries out to us, Blood of the Invokers, fulfill the ancient covenant and grant unto me the vessel promised. And with that, Ramza is swallowed up in a rift. Very spooked, we make a strategic retreat back to the Prima Vista with Alma. As we look back behind us, we see a ghostly man, not unlike Ramza, that asks us, have you the courage to face true evil? Now, left with more questions than ever before, we wonder what the voice meant by Blood of the Invokers. Was the Darai family responsible for summoning Ultima? Or perhaps are they kin? We then receive a vision from the Echo. We see Oran Darai telling Delita that Ramza did not die as told in the story but instead abandoned his body so that his etherical soul might live in the Orosite. Oren explains how Ajora Glabados, first of the Zodiac Braves, betrayed Mother Hydaelyn for the promise of coin and power by summoning a terrible evil from the depths of the Celestial Abyss. This evil could only be bested by a warrior of light, yet Ramza was unable to defeat it. He believed that if he could imprison Ultima, that a warrior of light in the future could finally defeat the High Seraph. In order for the seal to hold, Ramza would sacrifice himself to keep Ultima at bay. As to not draw attention to any lesser warriors attempting to release Ultima, he instructed his companions to strike Ramza's name from history, ensuring that in the future, only those strong enough, dedicated enough, would find out the truth and defeat Ultima. This is how Delita became king, Ramza was forgotten, and Oran came to write the truth in his journal for the future. All is Ramza's dying wish. The blood of the invokers was not a reference to actual kin, but rather the line chosen by Hydaelyn, the warriors of light. Alma and now Ramza are the bait to lure us into Ultima's domain. Knowing the dangers that lie ahead, Fran admits that she was only ever here to steal an Orosite and use its power to reclaim Dalmasca. However, she now knows of the dangers that would pose. She offers to escort us to the monastery personally instead. Wise choice. After entering the monastery, spending some time in queue, and finally defeating Ultima, we find Ramza in the rubble, who appears to be okay. We look over and suddenly see Ramza, the other one. This past warrior of light thanks us for accomplishing what he could not. Delita meets up with his old friend once more, and with that, Ramza and his companions can rest in Hydaelyn's embrace. We manage to prove Genimus's theory true. Evilis existed, Ramza existed, and Oran Darai was no heretic but a hero. And yet, Genimus wishes not to share the truth with the world as it is, but rather how it could have been. The final act of the Zodiac Brave story will instead tell of how Ramza and Oran smote the Angel of Blood and saved Ibelis from embarking on a final journey far beyond the horizons. Dang, we got cut out of the movie. At least Genomus offers to write a book about our travels across the three great continents.
I feel like we've earned a little reprieve. That was quite the roller coaster of adventures. That should be me up on stage. I'd make a much better Ramza. <laughs> yeah, that Ramza looks nothing like him. So Kat, I was thinking, we should write our own place. That would be so cool. We could tell stories of our greatest adventures. Okay, so this may sound crazy, but what about the tale of the mighty primal Titan, but he's stuck in after work traffic? <laughs> what if Ramu was a horse? I got it. Ifrit and Garuda have a baby and name it Ramen Pasta. Dude, we're gonna be rich. Be sure to hit the thumbs up and subscribe down below. What did you enjoy or not enjoy about the Evil East Raid series? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching. <laughs>